Well, good afternoon and thank you all very much for coming. And um, I think you'll really, really enjoy working here with us and helping us out in so many different ways. Um, so what I'm going to do is just take you through a bit of where we've been. So um, some of the history of the museum, how it comes to be in this building, how the collection was put together and um, some of the history of the museum up to the present day. So there we are, there is our logo, the Holborn Museum. Um, the logo for me represents sort of where we are now, uh, the, the, the essence of what the museum is about. You'll notice that it uses two different fonts, so you've got the upper one, which is a sort of traditional Roman style font, sort of classical style, and then the lower down one, which is much more modern looking. And so it represents the museum, uh, the, the sort of sense of the museum as being um, a historic collection in a historic building, but with a modern extension, and that's something that looks towards the future and that takes an interest in the contemporary as well. This is our old logo. This is the logo we had until 2010, and I put it in because, again, it symbolises perhaps a different image of the museum as somewhere that was very much about the, uh, particularly the sort of neoclassical, the sort of Georgian um, side of things. And that's, that's um, an identity that's still very, very strong with the Holborn, um, but that isn't everything that we do. So the museum closed to the public in spring 2008 and reopened in May 2011. Since then, uh, so that's five and a half years ago, and um, a lot's been going on since then. Um, so this is um, the addition to the building that was made between 2008 and 2011, Eric Parry's extension. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But just to locate the building, um, as you know, you found your way here. This is where it is. It's at the end of Great Pulpney Street. And um, it actually was built originally in 1796 as the Sydney Hotel. So the idea was always that this building would be the gateway to Sydney Gardens. It was the way through to the Pleasure Gardens beyond. Um, but the building has changed considerably since then, and the facade that you see now is actually, um, it was actually completed in 1916. Uh, so do not be deceived by that very um, Georgian looking facade, it's actually Georgian in the sense of George V. Um, the collection in this building has really nothing to do with the building. It's the collection principally of Sir Thomas William Holborn who was a baronet. He was the fifth baronet of Holborn of Menstry, and a Victorian collector who had really a typical Victorian townhouse collection. Here he is, there is Sir William in 1827. He was born in 1793, so he's the son of minor Scottish aristocracy. His father was a uh, famous but not hugely successful admiral. So this is his grandfather, Admiral Holborn, with Sir William's father, Francis, so late, later Sir Francis Holborn. Um, and William, being the younger son, was sent to sea in the footsteps of his grandfather. He was sent to sea in July 1805, aged only 11. And one of the first things he had to do on board this ship, this is the, the ship in the middle there, that is HMS Orion, and he suddenly found himself engaged in battle at Trafalgar, fighting the French under Nelson. Um, an extraordinary thing to happen to somebody so young, but there would have been many boys around him who were of the same age, both gentlemen and um, ordinary sailors. So he wasn't alone. Um, he actually retired. He started um, his career in the Navy very young, age 11, and he also finished very young. He retired in 1815, um, and then proceeds as a young gentleman to travel around Europe. 
This is a portrait that was made in Milan in 1824. Um, he has just inherited his father's estate, so he inherited in 1820 when his father died. But having been a sailor, he had never really had a sort of formal school education. So we think he was very much a self-educated, self-taught person. Um, he travelled on the continent, as this portrait shows. What we don't know was whether he already started collecting when he was abroad. He certainly bought one or two things on his grand tour, but we don't know whether he brought um, some significant objects back from his tour or whether he was actually buying in Bath. We don't really know, in fact, anything at all about how he put the collection together. There are one or two things that he inherited from his family, but because he had all his papers destroyed, we just don't know where anything comes from, which is enormously frustrating. It's a huge gap in our knowledge, which will be very, very difficult to fill. Um, this is where he lived. He lived, um, this is Cavendish Crescent, so it's up on the other side of Bath, um, near the School of Art. And he lived in this present, in one of these townhouses. So they're not enormous houses for a member of the aristocracy, particularly when you have to share them with three sisters. So he and his three sisters, all of them unmarried, lived in this house um, where life was not always quiet and peaceful. We know that particularly with one of the sisters, there used to be a lot of fighting going on, mostly over money. But because it's quite a small house, he has to collect small things. So we don't have big works of sculpture. We don't have um, big statues. Most of the paintings are fairly small. And some of the best things in the collection are actually very tiny things, which were these two same ones on the table. Yeah. The fact that he had his photograph taken with these two objects suggests that he um, considered them to be particularly important. And you can see those upstairs alongside that photograph. In his lifetime, he was considered to be quite an important collector and quite an important connoisseur. He was elected to a group called the Burlington Fine Arts Club, which um, gave him great social prestige and recognition. So uh, he would have been in that club with some quite significant figures in the art world, uh, people like Whistler, Lord Leighton, Rossetti, all of them artists, and John Ruskin. And um, he also exhibited in some very important national and international exhibitions. Um, he dies in 1870 and leaves everything to this lady. This is his sister, Mary Ann Barbara Holborn. And it's Barbara who establishes the Museum Trust in her will. She writes in a codicil to her will, in fact, um, that uh, she's leaving the collection as the nucleus for the establishment of a museum of fine art for the city of Bath. It takes a while after her death in 1882 for the museum to become established. And it first opens to the public in this building. This is in Charlotte Street, so it's sort of opposite the entrance to the car park in Charlotte Street. And um, you can see from this photograph how very cluttered it was. It opened to the public in 1893, and the entire collection was on display in these wonderful, big, ebonized showcases. Um, but every inch of display space has been used. An article in 1917 explained how it was so small a building that early curators had no chance of exhibiting anything to advantage. But they also said that the museum was well worth rummaging in. Um, but the first 10 years or so of the museum's life were really very, very quiet. Very few people visited. Um, not much happened. <clears throat> now, Barbara Holborn had originally wanted the museum to be housed in this building, what was called at the time Sydney College. Um, but in her own lifetime, she was unable to negotiate a sale 
with the owners of this building and Sydney Gardens behind. And for many years it was actually dirty. It looked like this. A bit of a mess with broken windows and ivy growing everywhere. But eventually the trustees were able to secure this building um, when some other family money was released. So they purchased this building in 1913 and they hired the architect Reginald Blomfield to make major alterations to the building. They also purchased a small part of Sydney Gardens from the council. So they did a deal whereby the council took over the main part of the gardens and the museum just kept the small part which is now walled off. So anything beyond that gate belongs to the council. Um, this is what the building looks like today. So it opened in 1916. Here you see Blomfield's facade as opened in 1916, which is exactly 100 years ago. So you'll see this little logo around the place, and um, that's just something that we're doing to celebrate this centenary. Um, This was the back of the building as designed by Blomfield, a sort of um, neoclassical pastiche, um, but a bit messy. Uh, so the museum opened in 1916 and it was described as a model of arrangement for all local museums. It was, at the time, it was a lovely, shiny new building, it had lots of space. So people began to take a real interest in this new museum. It also had a very strong um, curator with lots of fresh ideas. And the building attracted lots of donations of objects for the collection and loans to the collection. So just one example, the Netsky collection was given to the museum uh, by the Reverend Winwood, who was the chairman, the first chairman of trustees, and he left this little collection to us. So for the first 50 years, the museum, um, really not that much happened apart from adding to the collection, making it grow. Again, as before, not a huge number of people were visiting. And then during the Second World War, as happened with so many big buildings like this, the museum was taken over by an official body. It was taken over by the Admiralty, which uh, was, was really dominating Bath, using Bath as its headquarters during the war. All the collections were safely stored away, and um, that was the time when a little tea house out there was built, as a tea house for um, air raid wardens. The museum reopens after the war, but it's in a bit of a mess, and the finances are particularly messy. Um, and in desperation, we need to keep the museum going. The trustees made a decision which we now very much regret, which was to sell some paintings. Um, they sold about 50 pictures, mostly ones which were in poor condition or which they thought to be of poor quality. And some of these are now reappearing on the market. This is an example of one of the pictures which used to be in this collection and has since gone abroad it's happened to be on the art market, but I think this is a great loss. However, that sort of clear out of pictures that the trustees at the time didn't like did make way for some fresh new blood, and it was from 1955 onward that the 18th century British part of the collection really began to gain strength. So the wonderful um, Alan Ramsey's, which we have upstairs, were given to the museum in uh, the 1960s by, again, the Chairman of Trustees. Um, but actually that didn't do that much to resolve the financial situation to help with operating costs. And through the 60s, the Trustees continued to explore options, um, some of them fairly desperate ones. So there was a talk, for instance, of sending the collection to Manchester uh, or to Derbyshire completely disconnecting it from Bath. Um, but the local community was horrified at the idea of this collection leaving Bath. And so they persuaded the council to give a small grant towards the upkeep of the museum. Um, but that didn't really go far enough. 
until the establishment of this institution. This is the University of Bath, um, which was established in, uh, well, 50 years ago, exactly. So uh, it's 1966 um, that the university was founded up on Claverton Down. And the trustees of the museum and the university governors came up with an idea to affiliate the museum to the university because the University of Bath is really um, a science university and they wanted to, and I quote, to enable the university to fulfill its wider cultural role and to provide a common meeting ground between scientists and humanists, so to unite the sciences and the arts in this building to make it a venue for art activities, exhibitions, art classes, music. Um, and the university helped to fund a temporary exhibition gallery in the basement. They ran a program of exhibitions, of lectures and of concerts. And then in 1977, the museum got um, a whole new section, the Crafts Study Centre. Um, this is a picture of a, a textile artist called Susan Bosentz, who's uh, installing some of her hand-printed work at the, at the Holborn. The Craft Study Centre was really managed as a separate entity, but it was housed here. And it was um, a very significant collection of 20th century crafts that was established by the makers themselves or by their, their heirs or their, their executors. It included some really important things like Bernard Leach's archive um, and archives of uh, calligraphers and textile artists, furniture makers, and some really very significant stuff here. Um, and regular exhibitions of 20th century crafts. The idea was that the Craft Study Centre would be housed in an absolutely enormous extension to the museum. It turned out, however, being the mid-70s, the money was just not available. Um, and so, uh, eventually, a lot of the craft study centre was actually housed in this room here. It was sort of divided up into storerooms and things. And a lot of it was, was housed and exhibited in this really quite small space. Um, anyway, the craft study centre eventually moved out in 1999. It was felt that the Holborn and the Craft Study Centre were better going their separate ways. They were stronger apart. This is how it looks today. So much better than it looked here. It's now housed in the University of the Creative Arts at Farnham in Surrey. It's quite an important chapter in our history. And the reason I mention it is that you may well get people saying, oh, didn't you used to have Bernard Leach things or calligraphy or something like that, or quilts? Um, Yes, we did, but not since 1999, so they're quite a lot out of date. Okay, so 2000 really is the year where things begin to change. Um, this is how the museum looked in the 1990s. Still <laughs> not much different from how it looked when it was in, in Charlotte Street, really. Those are the same display cases from the 1890s. They're still very packed with objects. They're also really packed with an awful lot of words. Um, the walls were covered in brown hessian. I remember being very shocked when I saw that. Um, and it was these, these areas here, and you'll recognize this as the ballroom, by the way, but these, these areas were producing a lot less light than they are now because they were blocked out. Um, but again, there was a bit of a financial crisis. The council had been cutting its grants, the university had been cutting its grants, and the museum really needed to stand on its own two feet. So around about 2000, there was a big change in the board of trustees, there was a big change in the staff as well, and the museum moved forward with a much stronger identity um, without the craft study center. Um, as a historic collection in a historic building and one that showed um, exhibitions. So the exhibitions became very central to what we do here. So that's the ballroom today. Ah, much better, much more light. 
um, much uh, cleaner layout of cases as well. I'll just show you some of the other features from the old days. This was the picture gallery um, before we closed, shortly before we closed in 2008, with these really scary blinds, and you had to, um, where's it gone there? You might just be able to make that out. There was a sort of a winch in the wall, and you had to turn it to make the blinds go across the ceiling. And there were these radiators pumping out heat, very good for the paintings hanging above them. Um, so whereas nowadays it can be a little bit chilly in there, in those days it was usually far too hot. Um, and uh, yes, generally pretty run down. But as you can see from this, the collection was, was very, very good. Um, this is the lift. This was really scary. It's a, it's a charming 1920s lift. Um, it had one of those grills that went across the entrance, but it didn't actually take you all the way up to the top floor. You had to get out of the lift um, if it didn't stick on the way up. You'd get out of the lift, open the grill, and then you'd still have to go through a flight of steps to actually get into the top gallery on the top floor. So in 2001, an architect was appointed, Eric Parry, and um, he was looking at the building as it had been in the 1790s. He was really intrigued by the way in which the building seems to have two faces. It's got this very stern, formal face that looks towards the city, and on the back, a very different sort of facade, one which is um, much lighter, it's got lots of big windows, and it's suspended in part on these little slender columns. So it's, it seems to be floating. And to either side there are supper boxes where you could sit, in Jane Austen's time, you could sit and have breakfast or tea. And Eric Parry wanted to regain some of that sort of light, airy, pastoral fun sense at the back of the building. So this is one of his early designs. He always wanted a building that floats. As you can see here, it's a heavier looking on the top than it is on the bottom, but you get that sense of lightness. And he wanted to use also materials that would reflect the path around, that would reflect the colour and movement of trees, that would reflect the people moving around the garden and enjoying themselves. So very much with that early 19th century image of the garden in mind. One of the most important things we did in the redevelopment was to move the staircase. So um, in, in Blomfield version of the building, you would enter the building, but you could go no further because of the stairs. And that completely destroyed the continuity of really the city plan, which had been designed as early as the 1770s by Robert Adams. So Adams' idea was that you would travel over the Pulteney Bridge from the marketplace, come over Pulteney Bridge, all the way down Great Pulteney Street, straight through this building, out the back, and then up on the other side to the top of Sydney Gardens, creating a continuous path that's nearly a mile long. Well, this wall here, and this desk where you have to pay for your ticket, put a stop to that. They, they create a barrier and the architect really didn't like the way that it creates that barrier and stops people from getting through from the city to the countryside. So this was his concept for how the building would work. Throughout the building, you have a very strong sense of being able to see through. And there are some spaces. If you stand where this shadow man here is standing, you can, in one direction, you can look down Great Pulteney Street and in the other direction, you can look up Sydney Gardens through the back window. So the idea is that the, that the building is um, almost like an archway that you can pass through. Just to run through quickly the features that the new building has allowed us to have, a purpose-built exhibition gallery, that's a rover gallery on the top floor. Um, we divided this space into two levels, the reason being that because the collection is so much about very small things, very intimate domestic sized things. We needed small domestic sized spaces. So hence why we created 
these little sort of compartments in the new galleries on the first floor. Then on the ground floor, a lovely cafe, uh, which is a response to those Regency supper boxes. Um, and then underneath, this is a storage area. It's a storage area for the collection. So for the first time, we've got proper, decent, up-to-date storage for our collections and for things that we borrow. And then, uh, you can't see them on here, but it's also enabled us to have proper loos for the first time and a lift that goes all the way up to the top without having to climb any stairs. Um, and the ballroom, as you know, is, is much more open now. Much, it has much more light coming into it. It's, it's a much more pleasant and welcoming space. So, um, I'll just show you quickly. I know we're, we're short of time now, but this is um, our, uh, the, the exhibition designer that we worked with, um, a, a very interesting and imaginative designer called Metaphor. Um, they designed our galleries with us, and they very much were thinking of a sort of cabinet of curiosities approach, whereby um, we could have small objects displayed to their best advantage with drawers underneath so that you can explore things underneath the drawers. And then each of these cases, um, please point this out when you talk to people, but each case has a very clearly identified star object. So if you're in a hurry, you could just concentrate on that one star object in, in the middle. It sort of sums up what the whole case is about. And then you can move on. So it's sort of got three levels. It's got the one important thing, the other things, and then if you're really keen, three drawers that you can explore. Just an example of a drawer. Do explore the drawers yourselves and enjoy them. Um, so I think that's, that's it. I've sort of gone through um, the building and what you can see in there, how it's been developed. Um, but the last uh, five and a half years, um, we've been very, very busy. There's always something going on. We've had some fantastic, very well received exhibitions. Um, here are some visitors enjoying themselves, so we appeal to a very wide audience. Um, older people and younger people all being really inspired by, by our collections and by our learning program. Um, and as I said, there's always something going on. Um, the wonderful light installation that we did one year in winter called Field of Light. Um, Colourscape, which was um, it was like a sort of very um, smart, bouncy castle outside. Um, an extraordinary thing where you could explore colour and music, um, particularly aimed at small children, but um, fun for anybody. Um, and there we are. You never know who you will meet at the Holborn, so uh, just, just be aware of that. So I will finish there. Um, but um, do ask me questions if you see me around and want to ask me things. Or, um, and uh, yes, thank you again for joining the team. Welcome.